Well, good to see you guys. Are y'all doing okay today? You look good. Well, most of you do, and what I can tell. Thank you for again for letting me be with you. It's again, it's just a privilege for me to be with you. Uh, uh, always a joy. And uh, Sabrina and I love being part of this church family and uh, seeing what God do- has done here. It's just, it's just fun. Uh, we miss you guys. We miss this area. Uh, we really miss living over in Davison. I was sharing with somebody earlier. Uh, now we live in a suburb. Oh. But that's okay. You know, we're, we're doing well, and we, we love what God is doing with us and, and how we get to have ministry in Michigan and around the world. Uh, truly, it is a privilege. And as Jerome was saying, thank you. Thank you for giving through cooperative program. Thank you for supporting missionaries all around the world, hundreds, thousands of missionaries, 4,200 plus missionaries now. Uh, thank you for planting churches. You, you've helped plant over 50 churches here in Michigan recently, and uh, that's what we have going right now, 52 church plants. You're helping us plant new ones in Arabic areas and Hispanic, and there's just a lot of great things happening, and you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you for partnering with us. Uh, for one church to try to do that by themselves, it, it's impossible, but we can do more together. And thank you for being together with us as we try to punch holes in the darkness as God leads us. Well, take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to 1 John. 1 John, a great epistle. If you'll go over there, if, you're, if you hit the Revelation, go back left, Jude, and then you got 1 John. Uh, if you hit Peter, go right, all right? So you should find it there. 1 John in chapter 1 in verse 5 through 10. And this is what the Word of God tells us this morning. It says, this is the message which we've heard from him. And declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Guilt. Anybody ever deal with that in your life? (laughs) I like what one pastor said, guilt eats at your innards. It does. Guilt just chews away at who you are and can be debilitating. It it can be destructive. Guilt is something that we all deal with at some time or another. But I want you to know something. If, If God forgives and you are his child, and you have been born again, your sins have been confessed and put under the blood of Jesus, there's no room for guilt. It goes away. Well, look at this passage with me, if you would, please. In, verse, in the first verses there, it, it, show, it talks about the concealing of sin in a Christian's life. You've heard the term, it's error to human. It, it, it's error, uh, to err is human. Everybody knows that. We all blow it. <laughs> Cover, to cover it up is also uh, when we blow it we don't like people to know it when I do something wrong I don't want to go out public and tell everybody what I've done I don't like my wife to know it though she happens to know everything I do I don't know how that is I think it's some kind of female radar but when I mess up she knows it see God knows it every time we mess up as well He said, this is the message, that first verse, which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Uh, That metaphor, that likening of God to light, it it comes from the the original word there is phos. It means, it's where we get the word phosphorus. And uh, there's a lot of different terminologies in the English language used that that prefix of that word. Uh, But it's not just that he, he, it says he is light and not just the light. His essence, 
Part of his, his character is that he is light. When John's talking about this and he's talking about God, he, he, he's speaking basically in three aspects or three characteristics of, of the light and that God, is, and that God is. When you think about him as light, you think about uh, the, the physical part of it, uh, very the glory of God. And yet throughout the Old Testament, when Jesus showed, when, when the Father showed up, when, when the Father showed up, he was always represented by this Shekinah glory, this light, this wondrousness. Because that's who he is. He, it, it, his very essence is light. And when he shows up, it's his glory that comes out. Intellectually, we think about light and uh, it represents God giving insight or knowledge to us. He, he, he knows and he understands. God has this ability to shine into and see in every crook and crevice of our lives. He knows because his light exposes all of that. See, God is light, not only his glory showing up, but also he knows things about us. And also morally, it represents his holiness, his purity. It represents his purity in that when light truly begins to shine on something, it, it exposes the corrupt and decaying nature. Uh, this next Thursday, I'm going to have a little procedure called hip replacement. And one of the things they do in surgeries and many times when they're when we're operating on the individual they will they will try to do it laparoscopically if they can now this next one i'm doing is not it's going to be open it up cut it off yank it out put something in and we'll go again but i get another hundred thousand miles out of this deal folks i'm telling you but anyway laparoscopically what they'll do is they'll they'll poke some little holes in you and then they will send a camera down into you or wherever the affected area may be. And on that camera, there is a light. It is an amazing thing. Now, I know all of you understand the wonders of YouTube. If you want to see some of that, you can go see those things on YouTube. But those, that camera and that light goes in there and it exposes to the surgeon that which is decaying or cancerous or bad. It puts a light on it and shows it up. And that way he can extract it and take care of it. It's what God's light does. It goes down into the, our very innards of life and exposes that which is decaying and wrong. I thank God for the light, don't you? That he knows what we really need dealt with in our life. He understands. And, and it, this purity, his light goes in and it exposes that which is impure. You ever moved into a, I don't know, maybe you were a much higher level of living than I was when I was younger, but when we moved into an, an apartment sometimes, there were others living there. They were called cockroaches. And uh, when we were very young, we, we moved into this one place and you turn the light on and oh man, they just went everywhere. No, we dealt with it. We didn't live in that. We dealt with it. I promise I'm not that nasty. I really, I'm really not. But I mean, you turn that light on, you open up that cupboard door and all of a sudden they went everywhere. That's what light does to the nastiness of our lives. It exposes it. What do we want to do? We want to run and hide. It wants to run and hide from the very purity of God. Well, it, it, this light is not only about purity, but it's about productivity. Here's a wonderful thing about light. And here we, here in the northern part of the echelon of the United States, we understand how important light is, don't we? Because this time of year, I get depressed. I get funky. I, and I, and I, you know what I found out we can do? We have a light in our bedroom, and Sabrina moves it around, and it's a special light that puts out the particular ray bands that we need, and it helps us. We, we literally put it on our bodies and under our legs, and it helps us get the 
vitamins and the, and the nutrients that we need to keep moving and to keep us from being depressed. It makes me a lot more productive when I do that and when I get more light. When I don't get enough light, I'm not productive. God's light is the same way. It gives us what we need. It helps us to move forward and to produce in our lives. That's what the light of God does. It's also just pleasantness when you think of the light of God. Nothing is better after a long, dark winter than the bright light and the rays of sun. You just want to get outside and run, don't you? <laughs> you just, that's why this church empties in the summer, Pastor. Because everybody out the lake, running and playing. It has nothing to do with your preaching. I'm just telling you. It has everything to do. And I turned myself back on. Sorry about that, Pat. I mean, we've just been, we've been trapped in the closet. And we want out. Still ought to come to church. I'm just telling you. All right, that's another story. You know, he says that in him there is, in the original language, it says there's no not any darkness. I, I like that. It, uh, in, the, in the Greek language, it, it's a, there's a double negative in there. We don't do that in the English language because we don't think that is good grammar. But it's great theology, by the way. He says no, not any at all darkness. It's just a compounding of the fact and the truth. He's light. Just purity. Helps us be productive. It's just pleasant being in the light of God. We see that in the light, but look in that verse it talked about him. It says, it, it said, we, we heard him and declared to you that God is light, and it says, in him is no darkness. Now look at the next part. It says, and that was the light part. Look at, here's the lie that comes about. It's if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. We say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth's not in us. If we say that the truth is not in did you get that? If we're saying that we are believers in the Lord Jesus, we've been born again, transformed, our lives have been changed, we've been bought with the blood of Jesus, we, we know that the very light of God lives in us, and we know those things, and we don't live like it, Something's wrong. What do you say here? Now this is, hard, this is hard passage for us to look at. But he says, look, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we're lying. We're not practicing the truth. We're lying to others, by the way, when you look at this. We lie to others. How do you do that? Well, it's being hypocritical. We're telling others, well, I've been transformed by the blood of Jesus, but I live like hell and the devil. We're lying. We're lying to others around us. We're lying to ourselves. We're becoming what I call spiritual schizophrenics. Yeah, I'm born again. Oh, I don't live like this. Back and forth. But what is, you, can't, you can't live a divided life like that. And we're not only lying to others. We're lying to ourselves. We're lying to God. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar. His word's not in us. See, here's the problem. It's, it's called sin. None of us like to admit that we're sinners. None of us like to admit that we're wrong. How many of you said, man, I felt so good this week. I've had 10 people tell me I'm wrong. No, you don't like being told you're wrong. I don't like being told I'm wrong. No one likes being told they're wrong. We like to be told we're right. We like people to affirm our, the fact that we're right. You see, with God, many times we have that same attitude. We're saying, God, nah, I'm not that bad of a sinner. It's real. Well, God, you understand, it was just a mix-up. Well, no, actually, God, it was just a small mistake. It was a slip of the tongue. Well, actually, it's a glandular malfunction I've got. Well, it's just hormones. 
It's my heritage. You understand I've got red hair? You've heard that one before, haven't you? Well, it's an Irish thing. You just understand. My anger, my me, oh, that's just my heritage. That's just where I come from. You just have to live with it. It's still an excuse. You know that. Well, if I had better parents, or if, oh, uh, well, if, if it's my spouse, my wife made me do it. If I didn't have to live with her, I'd be a lot better person. If I didn't have to live with him, I'd be... You just, whatever, you just whatever, it's an excuse you call your spouse. Oh, it's my coworkers. Oh, my boss. If you had a boss like that, you'd act ugly too. We, our boss, it's my environment, it's my culture, it's society. We blame everyone else and everything else except us. When believers live like that and act like that and say things like that and make those excuses, we make Jesus look as if he cannot do what he says he can do, and that is change a life. It misdirects the lost. They get get confused. I've always been a lover of lighthouses being on the coast of Florida for so many years and now here in Michigan where there are, there are lighthouses all over our, our great state. I, I, love light, I love lighthouses and the symbolism. Of course, many of them are now defunct and the, there are other means of navigation and so forth, but they still have this allure to me. They, they're just beautiful things. The story was one li- of one lighthouse keeper because in those, in, back in older days, they had to make sure the light was always shining. And, and many times they did so through the burning of oils or uh, different types of fuels to create a light. And then some of them had electricity, but, but they always had to make sure that all of their, the panels on the outside of the lighthouse that protected the lens and the flame or the light itself uh, stayed clear so that when the, the light was shining and, and the rotating mechanism uh, would, uh, would let that light be released and shine out, uh, it, they just needed to make sure it was, they had a clear path through that light. Well, there was one lighthouse keeper who, who was uh, working up there and he was working on a, the Fresnel lens and, and doing some work and he had a big pole and he was cleaning and he made a mistake and he pushed back too hard, too fast and he hit an outside window and broke it and it just shattered. And it was a beautiful day, but he knew that there was some bad weather coming in and it would probably be three or four days. So what he did was he took a piece of metal, of tin, just corrugated metal, and put it up over that, that window area. He just covered it up. He said, I'll get, a, I'll get another piece of glass here in here in two days, and we'll get this thing fixed, no problem. Problem is that storm came in much earlier. And when, he, when these boats were coming in, these ships were coming in from a particular direction, they could not see the light in the lighthouse that they desperately needed in the midst of that storm. That pain, that window had been covered up and the light would not shine out. This is what happens in a believer's life. When we have sin in our life, when we have unconfessed sin that we don't deal with, it literally blocks the light and power of God in our lives. And people who are, who are drowning and desperately in need of the light and the love of God cannot see it because of our unconfessed sin. There's also a great loss. Look at, look at this next verse. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Walking in the light. Look, it's just a beautiful passage. Walking in the light as he is in the light, as he is. We have fellowship, not only with him, but one another. And that blood of Jesus has, has cleansed us from all sin.
what do we lose? What can we lose if we, as a Christian, as someone who's truly born again, what do we lose when we don't confess our sin and deal with it? What is it? One, we lose fellowship. Not only with the Father, but with others. Fellowship. Now listen, I'm going to make this very clear. Sonship and fellowship are two different aspects of a believer's life. Sonship and fellowship. Sonship, your fraternal, your, your relationship with the Father, is eternally secure and forever steadfast and is dependent upon, listen, the finished work of Jesus and his atonement for sin, not on us. My relationship with the Father, me being a son of God, a child of God, is not dependent upon me. It is dependent on what he did and accomplished and completed on the cross. That is a secure and fixed truth. We have that relationship. That's our sonship. Now, fellowship is another thing. Fellowship can come and go. Your fellowship with the Father, it can be interrupted. It can have a hiatus. It can have a mess. It can get messed up. Your fellowship with one another as believers can be the same way. Any of you men ever get out of fellowship with your wife? Fun, isn't it? Wives, same thing. Children, you ever get out of fellowship with your parents? (laughs) You do enough wrong stuff, you will. You see, does that change? Does that change your your relationship with your family just because you get out of fellowship with them as children? No, they're still your parents. Some of you go, man, yeah, they are. But yeah, they're still your parents. That's still your wife. That's still your husband. Even though you may be out, that doesn't change. The same with us and the Father. We can have, we still have that relationship with Him even though the fellowship can be broken. Because when that fellowship is broken, what happens is we lose our peace. You know the peace that passes all our... You're no longer in peace. You're in, you're in animosity with God. You're, you're separated. You're pow- the power of God quits flowing in your life. The productivity that God has provided for you and, and uses and, and does through you, it begins to diminish and wane. And your potential is limited. There's so many things that are affected when we're out of fellowship with God because we live in unconfessed, unrepentant sin. We lose fellowship. We lose our joy. I used to think the most miserable person on the face of the earth was someone who didn't know Jesus. Nope. The most miserable person on the face of the earth is someone who does know Jesus and is living in rebellion and out of fellowship with him. Now that's one miserable puppy right there. But look at these next few verses here. It it reveals sin in in life of a Christian, the revealing of sin. Listen, if Satan cannot defeat you by you living in in unconfessed sin, let's say you you confess that sin, you're dealing with it, you're walking in fellowship, you know where you need to be. If Satan can't get you to live in unconfessed and unrepentant sin, what he'll do, he will attempt to defeat you by bringing up the past. Those past confessed and forgiven sins. See, that's one of the, that's one of the stinky tricks of Satan. Those things that happened long ago that have been confessed, but they were deep, heinous, hurtful things in your life, but you confessed them, you repented of them, you've turned from them, and they're under the blood of Jesus. Sometimes Satan will try to bring those back up and beat you over the head with them. 
Oh, I, it happens to me all the time. I'm telling you, he comes up with stuff. He said, oh, you remember way back then? Yeah, I was pretty stupid. Yeah, I stepped in it. Yeah, you're just a terrible person. See, that's Satan. Because once Jesus forgives your sin and covers it, it's done. You see, the Spirit of God will convict, convict you legitimately. The Spirit of God convicts you legitimately. The Holy Spirit does not bring up your past again. Not your past sin. He does not. The devil wants to keep us looking at our past so that we won't be any good in the present. If, we can, if he keeps us focused on what we've done before, he, we will never be doing what God wants us to do now. Here's, here's good news. It, you know, it tells us that the scripture says that Jesus, take, they've taken our sins and buried them in the deepest sea. Isn't that a good thought and a good idea? Not only that, here's something that is cool. He not only buries them in the deepest sea, he puts up a sign that says, no fishing. Isn't that good? See, once... Now, what's, why are you still fishing for your old sin? Why are you still letting Satan fish in your pond when there's a no fishing sign? He's, he's separated them as far as the east is from the west. They're done. They're given. They're covered. But the Spirit, now listen, He will convict us very, very legitimately. And the Spirit convicts us very, very specifically as well. Not just legitimately, but specifically. Here's what Satan does. Satan is very vague. He said, oh, you're a bad person. Oh, you're a bad sinner. Oh, you're no good. Oh, you'll never be worth anything. And, and Satan will just make these big generalities. Oh, you're just so dumb. You can't be used. Oh, you remember those bad things you've done? In the past? You'll never be worthy of God. Or anything. S Satan lies in generalities. The Holy Spirit convicts specifically. Satan desires you to enter into this morbid introspection and when, he, when we're all caught up in unproductive, morbid introspection of our past, we will not be sensitive to the spiritual needs of others around us. We're just caught up with ourselves. All we're thinking about is, oh, how bad we are. And Satan is winning, and we will not be sensitive to those around us. We'll become self-consumed, self-centered, right where the devil wants us. Pastor Jerome is a smart man. I don't know if y'all figured that out yet. He's a very intelligent guy. Very intelligent, very sharp. And I, I really love him and respect him. <coughs> but I will not let him do brain surgery on me. He's good looking, smart, intelligent, <laughs> but he ain't cutting in my head. Not happening. Why? He's not qualified for that. That is not his job. Why in the world would we let anyone other than the great physician of heaven work on our souls? And yet we give in to Satan and others and his minions and people around him, those he uses, to dig at our souls and cut into us. See, the Spirit of God will be very specific. If you are, listen, Satan will always, again, be general. If it's real conviction of the Holy Spirit, it'll be very specific. Not only very specific, he'll tell you what to do about it. Satan will never tell you how to correct it. The Spirit of God will always do that. The Spirit convicts redemptively. When Satan, as I said, when Satan brings up those things in our lives, the whole purpose is to push us away from fellowship with God. But the Spirit desires to bring us back into the Father. Every time. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at the last part of this verse. Now here's this great part, wonderful part. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's how we're dealing with, a, with sin in the life of the Christian. Here's how we do it. We confess he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us.
See, the forgiveness of, in, of sin has already been taken care of under the blood of Jesus. The confession really brings about the cleansing. That word confession, uh, the original language word is, is a combination of two words. It's homo legao. It, it literally means to the same, say, logeo, say the same. Say the same thing. You're saying the same thing about as God is. In other words, if God says it's sin, you're saying it's sin. You're not making excuses. You're not trying to make it soft pedal it. You're not trying to cover it up. You're saying the same thing as God is saying about it. Homo let go. You say what God says. If God says it's filthy, rotten, and nasty, and wrong, that's what you say about it. You see, that's what confession is. Confession is not trying to cover anything. It's bearing your soul before God, saying the same thing, God. You confess. Here's the good thing about it. If we'll confess and agree with God and say the same thing, we have confidence in this. What is the confidence? That he's faithful. Pistos, he's, he's faithful. He, and, and that idea is it, it has action to it. <clears throat> he is faithful. He will. He's never backed up on it. He's never failed to do it. He's always true. He will absolutely do what he said he would. He's faithful and he is just. He'll do the right thing. The equitable thing. To do what? Forgive. If he may, if he may it's, uh, it's a very unusual word, but it literally means to send something away. It's one of the great uses of that word, to send it away, to get rid of it. That bad habit. Man, I want to get rid of that. I'm going to get it away from me. Confess it. What do you mean? Say the same thing that God says about it. Have the same attitude, the same words that God says about your sin. Confess it before him, and he will send it away. And then this, the final word he says here, and cleanse us. Catharizo is the word there. <clears throat> it's where we get the word cathartic. If you've heard that word, it's very cathartic. Uh, the idea is that uh, when something is cathartic, you, uh, you feel cleaned. You feel pure. You say, man, that was just a great cathartic experience. You feel like a cleansing throughout your body, your soul, your mind. That's what it means. He says, I, I'll just clean you up. That's where we get the word many times is used for the word purity. Anybody here named Catherine? If there's a Catherine here, uh, the idea is that you're pure. Purity. There you go. That's the root of that word. You're pure. You're clean. Believer, listen to me. If you are born again, you truly know that your sins have been forgiven. You are a child of God. Don't let the, the devil play the game of guilt and bringing up past sin and forgiven sin. Remind him there is a no fishing sign in your life because the blood of Jesus has forgiven those sins. But as a believer, your fellowship is imperative. The way you maintain the fellowship where you can have the productivity, the power, the presence of God, and purity, is to continually confess your sin and stay right before him. And the Spirit of God will always be very specific in those sins. Remember, Satan's always really general. And the Spirit of God will always, when he convicts you of a sin, will tell you what you need to do to repent of it and how to deal with it. Satan will never tell you that. He just wants to beat you up. So my friends this morning as believers, let's live in the light of God. Let's live in the presence and the power of his fellowship. And we do that by walking in purity and light and holiness through the daily confession of sin.
Don't let the devil beat you over the head anymore. Live in the victory that Jesus has provided for you. Let's pray.